When I first started, it was really hard for me. That is an absolute mindfuck. Like you just, that is like the worst place to be. Don't put yourself in a hole with it and stress yourself out with the algorithm changes because they're always going to change. And then I basically, social media today is one of like my best resources to be honest with you. Effectively, every post is unique. Yes. So there are broad kind of algorithmic principles. Yeah. You will know your audience best and you will know what resonates with them best, better than anybody else. Whatever happens in the first 30 minutes mm -hmm. with who sees it, who engages can make it massively different. everybody, we are back on the podcast and I have the fabulous Holly Hayes with me. She is part of the brain behind Stephen Bartlett's Dragon De Dragon's Den social media and she's done some amazing stuff with him over the last few years mm -hmm. and we're going to download all of the little secrets, tips and tricks that she's been learning. So Holly, welcome to Plymouth. Thanks, Dean. Thanks for having me. This is your boss's like home turn. I know. <laughs> exactly. Are yeah. you amazed by how glitzy it is? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I often forget that he's from Plymouth because I obviously when you hear social chain, you think of Manchester and things like that. But yeah, this is his his birth town, his kind of hometown where everything started. So um, yeah, it's it's so cool to be here and thank you for having me. This is really curious. Yeah. We were talking earlier. How did you manage to end up yeah. running Stephen's socials? What happened? How did you land that? Did you go yeah. interviews? What happened? Yeah, so I was working in a corporate job before and whilst it taught me so much, I was working in social with the corporate role. So everyone... Social in a corporate role, how does that work? Yeah, it's kind of an interesting one because there's so much red tape and there's so many things that you need to get approved and there's so many edits that need to be had. So personally for me, it taught me a lot and I'm very grateful for that experience, but it wasn't enough for me because within social and within the creative industry, as you'll know, obviously things move really, really fast. And for me, when I worked in a corporate, for corporate business and that kind of role, it was near on impossible to get things signed off, to get things moving at a timely manner, whilst also jumping on the trends and being receptive to everything that was going on in the industry. So I kind of thought, you know what, I've learned so much and I'm, you know, like I said, grateful for the experience, but actually with my career in social and and just my career in general, it wasn't giving me everything that I needed. So then I was on um, LinkedIn and my sister actually, so um, for those that have been watching the Diary of the CEO will remember this one, but Stephen had Jim Chapman on, an old kind of school YouTuber with the Zoella era. Um, and she was watching the video and we really liked Jim at the time. I kind of grew up with that. So I was like, well, who are you watching? And she said, oh, it's this guy called Stephen Bartlett. He's got a podcast called The Diary of a CEO. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. She saw that he was advertising for um, somebody in the social media realm. And I just thought, you know what? When I left my corporate role, I wrote down and I was like, I want to work for a company that actually values me, that actually I don't feel like a giant cog in uh, sorry, a small cog in like a giant yeah. machine. And I actually want to feel empowered and I want to feel like confident in what I'm doing. And then, yeah, I had a few, had a few interviews and then it was, that was kind of it. And I rocked up. I think I had a fairly, um, kind of long period of time, time I noticed in things, but then started in the summer and have been with him now for coming up to three years. It'll be three years in spring, summertime now, but, um, yeah, it's been amazing. I started and there was about five of us. We were working from his apartment. Everything was very scrappy. It was very fast and it was such a learning curve. And to see how much the business has grown from then to now is just absolutely amazing. So some people listen to this be like, okay, corporate, very planned, yeah. very regimented. Yeah. Anybody who's running a business is yeah. slightly crazy. And I would imagine given what he's done, building mm -hmm. a social chain up from nothing mm -hmm. is huge it's probably a vortex, right? Yeah. How did you adapt from that very structured world to a very kind of more kind of unpredictable or slightly chaotic maybe? Yeah, that's a good question. Definitely chaotic. Um, I think 
how I do it is obviously we have strategies in place and we know what the company would like to achieve with the podcast and with Steve and kind of all things like that. And normally he actually just sent one, but each January or to close the year out in December, he'll kind of send a little bit of what I would say is his version of like a mission statement. And he would basically say, this is where we're going the next year. This is what you're a part of. This is the journey. It's actually very motivating and it's really good for us to kind of know the path that we're on. But aside from that, there is so much reactivity in the business and there I always liken Steve to kind of like a crazy inventor. Like he is <laughs> thinking of things constantly. Like his brain is wearing all hours of the day. And that is also, that is his gift. And, you know, that comes with its own sets of limitations and things like that. But I think for me, how I do it is what I can control is the, to an extent, is obviously the social strategies that I looked up, that I look after. So his LinkedIn, his TikTok, his Instagram, other bits and pieces within that kind of role as well. But the bits that I can control, that the onus is on me, I have organised so I know what's what because there's a hell of a lot of content going out. So I have to kind of keep it as structured as I can possibly be. But then I, there's also an element of me leaving room for a change in direction. Or I might post something and we might be going down a different avenue with that post or a brand sponsorship might come in. And let's just say if I've got all my content done, done for that week, a brand sponsorship might come in and that has to now go on a certain day. So to answer your question, I try and be as organized as I can within myself. But then I also know from being at the business a fair amount of time now and knowing Steve as well that there's so much unpredictability and there's that's also kind of where I think the beauty is and particularly with social you can't always plan everything out obviously mm -hmm. you, you you know for being organized and things like that you probably should but when you're in a creative industry there needs to be an element of the reactivity and of actually kind of just letting things flow and not getting put off by that but to be honest with you I think I was so relieved to be out of a really really structured system mm -hmm. that I actually really embraced that side of so you, you, chaos essentially like, it was almost like the, the, the extreme yes thing. yeah exactly so thinking about the social side of this right you've got to be organized yeah right so one of the things that I have is I will have loads of content mm -hmm. but sometimes when I come to post it I'm not feeling that piece of content yeah do you have like a bank of reserve content and then if something comes up and you can just chop it out? Do you mm. have that same thing of, I'm just not feeling this today? Yeah. So everything will be pre-scheduled. I like, if I possibly can, I like to get a week and a half ahead, if not a little bit more. That's not always possible with things, but I try. So in answer to the question, yes, there's been many a times where I've written a post two weeks three weeks whenever before and I've actually come to post it or it's scheduled and I thought or oh, maybe um things have changed maybe actually that's not the direction that I think we should go down if it's a podcast clip and I'm writing the copy for the podcast clip it might be okay actually you know Steve's opinion may have changed or we might be navigating it in a different way but with me even though we post such a high rate I also would never want a post to go out that I don't think is actually worthwhile being there. If it's not worth worthwhile being there and if I look at it and if I think I don't think this will hit the mark or I don't think it does Steve justice or the brand justice, I just won't post it out. I would rather not have a post go live that day and actually dial it back than have something go out and just not be completely happy with it. I think that's kind of what you're saying. That's the nature of when things are moving so quick. That is bound to happen. Like you're yeah. bound to not love every piece of content. So so just playing that out a little bit more, mm. there'll be times when, like I'll talk to people and say, mm -hmm. say something in a post. Yeah. Do you think like, sometimes I feel like people over explain in their content. Yes. Try and say too much or try yep. and expand and make their point. Like almost like a blog. Mm -hmm. How do you grapple with that whole issue of it's social media it's fast mm. and trying to land a point at the same time yeah it's a good question it's a hard one I always think it depends on the post it depends on the objective for the post there are some times where if I use LinkedIn as an example if the asset is more of a kind of explanationary asset if there's a more of a storyline it might be an old clip of Steve Jobs or of 
um, or of Elon Musk like when he was growing up or from the podcast, if there's a lengthier point, then I will try to go down, well, within reason, I expand the point a little bit more. If I look at an asset and I think, actually, okay, it's a still asset, it actually doesn't need that much explaining. I'll just keep it short and sweet. But my measure is, I always say this to myself, if I did not work where I'm working, if I didn't do this job, would I engage with this piece of content? Would I actually read it? Looking at the copy. And if the answer is no, I'll just, I'll change it. But I think a lot of the times I see on LinkedIn, a lot of creators or entrepreneurs or whoever, they write out these really, really long posts. And that's not to say don't write a long post. I mean, Steve, we write a long posts, you know, fairly often, but I never say write it for the sake of writing it. If you feel like it needs extra sentences or an extra paragraph to expand the point, sure, go for it. But if you feel like you're just adding it in and it's what, you know, we would kind of describe as something that's fluffy or that's something that's you're going around the houses, then I just take it out. But I think if it's a long form piece of content, if you need it to be long form, which is completely fine. And like I said, we post long form, but I always read it afterwards. And I always think, right, have I remembered what I've said on the first paragraph? If I have no idea what I'm talking about, then I'll just remove it or I'll change it. Sometimes the long posts work for the stories and sometimes, like I said, short and sweet and direct is better. I think you could still be direct with long form copy, but you need to do it in a curated way that the audience isn't going to get bored because everyone's sat on obviously their phones now and people are just scrolling, scrolling away. It's really hard to keep the audience's so attention. You're kind of saying long form should be purposely long form. Yes, yeah, exactly. Like if you're, I mean... There's been many a times where I've looked at an asset and I thought this will be perfect for me kind of going into more depth or expanding out the point. And then actually I come to write it and I think, well, I don't want to explain what the asset is because people know what the asset is. They can see it. So there's no value there to the audience by me just explaining the point. So I'm not going to do that. And then I kind of think, right, what is the other angle here? If there's another angle that actually works really well with the asset, is on brand for Steve, is on, you know, fits the objective of, of where this post is going, then I'll include it. If there's not, then I'll just keep something very short and sweet. Because I think, I always try and think to myself, if this is adding value, add it in. If it's not, and I know I'm waffling, which I know when I do it, then I just have to take it out and and refine it because I would rather get to the point and actually have a really a piece of content that's really concise and that's really very accurate in what I'm saying and, and can give value to, to Steve's audience than waffle on about something. Okay. So what's too short? Yeah. So too short in the sense of... What's the shortest you've posted? Probably two, two words, three words. And I bet it blew up, right? Yeah, it did. Yeah. So, so how how do you take that? Considering you can explain something in long form, yeah. and it can blow up because you touch somebody's emotions, yeah. Or whatever, and then you can land like almost like a mic drop. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Start wasting time. Full stop, and then yeah. you're done. Yeah. <laughs> how do you judge when to do what? Yes, I look at the asset and I think what's appropriate for the asset. For example, the one that came to mind is we uh, posted a piece of content and I believe it was from Pinterest. It was kind of like a street quote, if you like. And I think the asset was something like um, be kind of brave enough to try something new and, and suck at it at the beginning. It was to that kind of effect. The caption was quite literally, I think it was like, read this or... Um, you need to you need to see this today. It was so, so short and sweet. It was a copy along those lines because actually we kind of felt that was all that was needed for the asset. It was kind of, there's not always a one size fits all rule. You just judge it by the asset. Or for an example, there was a post that we put up and it was of um, Usain Bolt and it was basically talking about um, how when he's interacting with different people, he was very, like, very kind in how he was interacting with people. He was really generous. And we, the post, the narrative of the post was actually that's the things that people remember and that's the things that people actually see that really help you understand someone's character. 
And for that one, I went into more detail because I felt like there was more that needed to be said. I don't think it would have done it justice, me just writing a few sentences or a few words or something like that. Because I think there was more to the point there that actually... Because I always think if people are scrolling, they might be like, okay, well, what is this post? What is this video about? If you can't clearly see what it's about, then that's where I lean in with the copy. Mm -hmm. If it's actually still asset and it's very clear and it's very succinct in its point and you know what it is, then I'll loosen up on the copy basically. But where I feel like I need to explain more, then I will. A lot of people will talk to me and I fight with them. LinkedIn is a professional network. Yeah. So they feel that it has to be more almost like journalistic. Mm -hmm. And then you have the people who say it's not Facebook. Yes. And you see people writing long form. You see people writing in very complex language. Mm -hmm. Just tell me what your view is on complex language and the balance between personal and professional. Yeah. Complex language I've never really been on board with. Because I think it depends who your audience is and who your community is. If they're going to understand what you're talking about, sure, post it in whatever kind of language you want. If they are not going to understand what you're talking about, then I I would put it in layman's terms because there's no point, I think, publishing a piece of content if your audience is not going to understand what you're talking about. I think the issue is where people feel like they have to add in the technical words add in the words that are more in depth to try and potentially sound smarter to try so why are they doing that i think it's probably trying to create an appearance of themselves on linkedin maybe they want to build their personal brand maybe they're looking to switch up their career but i think if you don't understand what if you under, write a piece of copy on linkedin and you understand what it is and you understand the message and you know that your audience will understand the message go for it like knock yourself out post what you want to post if you're pretty certain that okay you might know what it is but they're not going to know what it is do not post it because it doesn't matter if you could know what it is until you know the cows come home but if they don't know what it is there is no point in doing it so that's kind of where I stand on that and I think there's a really good question about the personal and professional balance I think particularly for LinkedIn, they are wanting users to show more of their personality. And I say this also about personal branding as well. I'll give you an example. A lot of people think personal branding is letting their audience see every single part of their life. If you go onto Steve's Instagram, there's not a picture of him like with his dog. There's not a picture of like what he had for lunch today. Like there's not a picture of him and his partner. There's not a picture of him you know, with family members, with anything like that. But you still feel like you know him in a sense because it's it's how the assets are curated. It's the copy that's used. It's the tone of voice that's used. It's the interaction that he puts up on stories. It's his broadcast channel. There are elements that you can pull to still make it feel personal. So I think going back to your question on LinkedIn with the line of being professional and being personal, I definitely think that it depends what you want to get out of your own LinkedIn. But I would say, as cringy as it may sound, as long as it's authentic to you, I don't think it matters. It depends what you what you want to get out of the platform and how you want to be perceived on the platform as well. Okay, so I'm going to push you and you can decline to Okay, go for it. So one of the things that I see about personal branding, particularly on LinkedIn, yeah. is we know selfies work, right? Yeah. They do work. But I see a lot of people kind of, I call it the Paris Hilton syndrome, Mm -hmm. right? They put selfies on there. They tell people about something that tragic that's happened in their life. Mm -hmm. And it might be a genuine story. It might Mm -hmm. not. Um, Mm -hmm. But you see this kind of LinkedIn cringe. And it's Mm -hmm. like selfies every day, model shots, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, They call it something else, which I can't remember what it's called. Mm -hmm. But there's loads of different things that, Kind of, my view is Mm -hmm. you want to be known for something. Yes. Not just be known. Yes. And I think there is this trend at the moment of almost Instagramming LinkedIn. Yeah. What's your thoughts on it? And you can be declined. Yeah, no, no. I think, I know what you mean. 
when I go on my personal LinkedIn, yeah, a lot of the times that's what I see as well. I always stand by the fact that whatever the asset is, if it is a selfie, if it's adding something to the actual copy, if it's adding something to the post, then post it. I think I think it's interesting because it's like LinkedIn a few years ago, like we're saying, very, very, very professional kind of best appearances on there, you know, keeping up maybe a slight facade or kind of how you would like to be perceived in industry. And then I feel like over COVID, it switched. And that's where people, like you're saying, are taking more selfies and they're kind of, um, yeah, quite literally kind of Instagram buying it, whatever that kind of word would be. But I think it depends what you want out of it. A lot of people are no longer using LinkedIn just for job opportunities or just to grow their network. A lot of people are using it to quote unquote grow their brand and they 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 want to be a LinkedIn creator. Like there's a new wave of like a LinkedIn creator. And like you're saying, it is taking that selfie. It is maybe posting a holiday picture. I, for Steve's brand, again, it depends what the narrative is of the post. If it fits the narrative, I mean, he definitely wouldn't post a selfie, but if there's a more of a personal picture, if it fits the narrative and it fits the objective and it's kind of gone through all of the checklist guidelines, if you like, that I have mentally, then fine. Yeah, post it. But I think there's a danger of falling into the trap of posting a selfie, not with Steve, just with other people in general, posting a selfie or revealing a bit too much that I kind of think that's not what is it actually adding because when you strip it back there's so many creators obviously it's such a saturated market like what what is the value that you're giving and that doesn't have to be anything intellectual it doesn't have to be about like motivation or discipline or it could just be making someone laugh like that's the value that you're giving them particularly on TikTok but what is the value I think when people are posting a selfie, perhaps it's kind of like, okay, if that fits with the narrative of the copy and it, you know, it it all works fine. But if you're just posting something for the sake of posting something, that's where I think you've got to be careful because you need to ask yourself like realistically, what is the value? What is the value of this asset? And what is the value of the caption that you're attaching to it? We all want attention. We all love attention. Yeah. We want attention for the right reason right exactly if i'm on linkedin to sell my services yeah it it's great if people resonate with us mm-hmm. in my backstory because mm-hmm. that helps build trust yeah but if all i'm doing is documenting my life yeah <laughs> exactly um they won't know the connection between oh that dean yeah seems like a nice person but mm-hmm. they won't see how we can help exactly you it's that balance and it's and it's also a balance between people understanding there's a face behind the brand there's a face behind what you know you're building and knowing you but then also knowing the value and I think that's the sweet spot it's creating a brand or creating an account on LinkedIn or any social platform where actually people feel like they know the person that's running it they understand what their values are they understand what type of content they can expect to see if they follow that person but then also on the flip side, what is the value that you're giving them? What is their shareability in that? What are the metrics that actually you're interested in mm-hmm. in posting for? Because like I said, it's so saturated. So there needs to be an element of value. There needs to be, if not an extremely high element of value, like there needs to be something that you are giving them because otherwise it's so easy just to press unfollow. Like we do it all the time. Like it's just, you're kind of wired for that because you're seeing so much content. At one point your brain is like, okay, enough now. Like I can't see any more content. So I think it's really, it's getting that sweet spot between, like I said, the personalization of what you feel like is appropriate for your brand and what you were trying to create. And then like you're saying, the value and actually allowing people to know you for something. Because, you know, if you are posting selfies left, right and centre, okay, great. But then what is the value behind that? Mm -hmm. The asset is such an important part of LinkedIn. If the selfie is utilising it and is helping to boost the post, okay, within reason, add it in. But actually take away the idea of adding a selfie what other asset could you use that's really powerful that would help boost the post because I think sometimes it's far too easy to lean on the things that you see everybody else doing 
and actually not do kids. yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly whatever whatever gets the views but i think actually in the long run it will be more of a detriment to you mm -hmm. okay so so you might not want to answer this one yeah <laughs> So there must have been in your journey from taking over and learning how mm -hmm. to to write like Stephen yeah. and put all that together. There must have been a journey where you've made mistakes and had that mm -hmm. feeling of dread. Yes. A post that you put out you thought would go one way and mm -hmm. it got took the wrong way or yeah. you wrote things and it didn't sound like. How did you mm -hmm. get through all of that? And yeah, the second part of that is only one post right yeah so how do you deal with that kind of like when it yeah work as planned i think well, i've been with him for like i said two and a half coming up to the three year mark it'll be this this spring summer but when i first started it was really hard for me to understand that because obviously when you're when the brand is a person that's when it's difficult of course every brand kind of personalizes itself anyway take um, you know, Unilever, for example, or Ryanair, for example, obviously they've got a personality. But when it's a person, that's where it's difficult. But I think for me, I knew I was hard in myself at the beginning. But then now, like I said, I've been around him for a long period of time. I know him and I know I've listened to him so many times that actually I've got a good grasp on his opinion or how he would normally phrase things. But in the beginning, yeah, there's so many times where I remember I'd post something and be like, oh God, like that's not potentially how I wanted that to come across or in my head, it's potentially not been phrased pro properly or it's not actually come to fruition how I would have potentially wanted it. But then for me, I think I just had to accept that it's just a learning curve. And I think I'm, I say unfortunately, because obviously on social media, you need to be testing, you need to be testing things. And in order for you to be testing things, yeah, sometimes you're going to post things and it's going to be taken the wrong way and it's not going to have the reaction that you want it to have. In those moments when something yeah. doesn't work, it feels like a big hole. Yeah, if, it's like, like devastating. Thing. Yeah, because I think a lot of people don't really realise like on social media, it's not just taking like a picture and then being done with it. It's so much time and energy that goes into that and it's strategic and there's a purpose behind it and there's like I said, an objective for every single piece of content. And it's it's hard. It can be quite devastating because, yeah, when you put so much time and effort into something and then you kind of, perhaps it doesn't get the numbers that you want or if you have an idea and actually it doesn't come fully to the place that actually you want it to, it's hard. But then I think from being in this industry for the length of time I have now, I've just come to learn that is part and parcel of it. And actually... You are only going to try, you are only going to see what works by trying new things and by just posting it. And I think I would rather be trying new things and seeing actually what works and what doesn't work and maybe just swallowing my pride for a second than not trying at all. So that's really interesting because I know a lot of people who get really het up about it has to work and yeah. they worry about if I do this, could it destroy my reputation? Yeah. And you know, they're not putting naked selfies on LinkedIn yeah. or anything, but suddenly they become obsessed with not posting at all. Yes. And suddenly become obsessed about every single post. That is an absolute mind... Can I swear on him? That is an absolute mind fuck. Like you just, that is like the worst place to be because then you're getting in your own head and then you're overthinking. And then like you're saying, it's debilitating because you're not posting anything at all. And then your engagement's dropping down and you're like, well, I'm in a vicious cycle now. I don't know what to post. But I think I always say this, like social media, of course, you know, insane industry now, literally like ruling the world and whatever. And but ultimately, again, it depends your objective, but it's a way to connect with other people. It's a way to build a business, build a brand, create opportunities for you that never even existed. Like there is an element of it that's meant to be enjoyable to an extent and that actually is meant to be you you know you're connecting with all sorts of people across the world that you actually perhaps hadn't even you know wouldn't have access to them before so I think there's an element of again I'm really lucky that Steve is very passionate of the sense of just try new things try new things try new things if it does not work again try new things you know with 
an experiment kind of mindset behind it of how you think it's going to perform. Okay, what are the metrics? So how do I understand if it's performed very well, if it hasn't? But try new things because otherwise, how are you going to know what actually works and how are you going to know what doesn't work? Yeah, you can't really. You, you can't. can't really what works no. What doesn't. Exactly. And then you keep and then you trap yourself. An example that I can give is um, on Steve's Instagram, we were doing, I think it was kind of like the back end of last year still quote assets with kind of like a handwritten font if you like um so those were performing well for us at the beginning kind of like any new piece of content and then it kind of you know as the content you know people get used to it and things it can perhaps kind of come quite um mundane or you know whatever yeah of course yeah it's it's no longer kind of like shocking or like oh what's this so then we experimented with potentially like different fonts or changing up the background. And we actually ran a series of um, paid A-B testing basically on Instagram. So what I would do is I would find a quote that I know has performed very well for us previously. I would make different assets. I would maybe change one. Yeah, it would be one variable. So I would maybe have um, a white background with this exactly the same font and quote and then have a blue background and run that as an ad and see actually which one performs best. And then I tried that with with the font. I was kind of like, okay, well, now I know that this color background performs really well for us. Let's try and change the font this time. And actually, if you go on his Instagram, you will see the font change. That's because that type of font that we're using now outperformed the handwritten font like nobody's yeah, business true. yeah <laughs> but again that's in unless i tried that i wouldn't have known and that's only a tiny change and you kind of think okay well what other changes could you actually make that's not it doesn't have to be anything huge it can be small tweaks it might be for example on reels it might be changing the color on the um on the subs it might be playing around with having the whole reel in black and white. It might be adding music to the first three seconds of it. It might be adding a transition. It's the small tweaks that I think, again, people get scared of kind of trying new things because they're like, oh, I don't want to try anything crazy and what if it doesn't work, et cetera. But it can be small things and small adjust- adjustments that you actually make that pays off in the long run. And and even now, even though you're three years in, you're working yeah. on an account with two million followers. Do you know what you mean? Yes, yeah. So total over Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn, I think we're close to six point seven, six point yeah, so, six point so six. A lot, 7. yeah. Obviously, you're doing a lot of testing that yeah. some people would find very difficult to do. Sure. But in effect, every post is a test for you anyway. Yeah. So you're learning from every post and going, I'll do more of that or less of that. Yeah. Uh, that bombed, that worked. Yeah. And so by posting, you're learning what works and what doesn't. Exactly. Yeah. Um, 6.7 million followers, probably a gazillion. We were talking earlier about yeah. how many posts you do every week. Yeah. Right. Are there still surprises? Yeah. There's still times where I'll post things and I'll kind of expect it to maybe go one way. For example, on TikTok, it might be we might have clipped in a really amazing segment of, you know, something that a guest has said. And actually I would kind of expect it to go one way and perhaps it doesn't. But I think, again, there's always going to be surprises in that. There's so many, there's so many other factors, particularly within social, well, organic social, that's not always easy to know. You know, there's loads of different circ- circumstantial factors that actually you might, like I said, not know from actually posting it. And it might have nothing to do with the quality of the post. It might have nothing to do with the content. But then if there are ever times like that, I kind of say to myself, okay, well, I'm not going to give up on this. If I truly believe and if it's got, you know, the hypothesis behind it and if it's got actually rationale behind it, I might do a series of kind of coming back to that like testing mindset I might do a series of tests where I think okay well this perhaps hasn't blown up this time but I'm going to try that kind of same format if it's like a still post on Instagram okay well this is the type of quote that I think would have done very very well I'm going to post for others and actually and actually see and actually measure whatever metric I would like to measure it might be you know likes or comments and then actually measure that against 
uh, the average likes of the previous like five or 10 posts or, you know, things like that. Because I think there's an element of don't be so quick to kind of make a decision just from the one post because like I said, there's so many other factors. You know, you might have an audience that is in, you know, a huge audience that's actually in America as opposed to, you know, England. You might be an English English creator, but actually you're still posting on English time zone. Well, you should probably be posting on obviously like American time zone. But, you know, that doesn't mean to say just because your content's not blowing up, it's the actual content that's you need to you know, change and actually mould. It's just the time that you're actually posting. So I think try things a few times to actually get a good measure of it rather than just kind of, you know, deading something off because you actually don't think it's worth it. Okay, so let's think about this from, I'm, I I know there's creators, but let's yeah. think about the average social media user. They're a solopreneur, yeah. small business owner. They want to use social media to build their brand, mm -hmm. personal brand, promote their business, all that kind of stuff. So yeah. They're not full-time creator, right? I'm going to ask a series of questions mm -hmm. right? and hopefully uh, yeah. you can answer them. How much should they worry about the algorithm? Um, I don't think you should worry about it. I think you should just know what's going on with it. I think it's something a lot of people I see on Instagram or, you know, socials all the time and people are like, okay, well, your post isn't doing very well, you know, because the algorithms change. Okay. Yeah. But actually look at the post itself. Like, if the algorithm hasn't changed, let's just say it has for sake's sake, would that post still do well? Is there value in it? Is it shareable? Is the audience getting something from it? I think don't put yourself in a hole with it and stress yourself out with the algorithm changes because they're always going to change and there's always going to be so many different updates and new features that actually is really hard to maintain and and I stay know, focused on. A lot of this stuff will be difficult to maintain. I mean, how do you manage that? Yeah. So I, I time. yeah. So I basically social media today is one of like my best resources to be honest with you. I have the tab open on my laptop and it doesn't close because I just go on it in the morning, maybe in the afternoon and then sometimes in the evening or the next morning and I refresh it and see what's, see what there is in within the industry that's new that I need to be aware of. It's having that understanding. I think if you're growing your business on social media, you're starting up and actually that's your main kind of marketing that, you know, stream, that's the main touch point for you with your customers and your client base. You need to know what's going on, but don't spend hours scrolling, trying to work out what the algorithm is, what the changes are, because I think that will just confuse you. And then you'll be so far removed from what the actual post is. And actually, like I said, the enjoyment of mm. posting and connecting and growing your business and growing your brand that actually you'll stress yourself out and you'll confuse, confuse yourself and it's definitely not worth it. So I think I would look at it as having an awareness of what's going on. It can be a really top line awareness of what's going on. Delve into things if you feel like it's appropriate for your brand. If you want to build your community more, Instagram broadcast channels, a great feature to do that. If actually that's not something that you're interested in right now, okay, we'll still be aware, still know that it's a new feature and it's popular, but then you don't have to necessarily work out everything that's going on with it. You can just have that awareness in the back of your head. So you're still clued in, but you're not stressing yourself out to the point of not posting anything and, and not knowing how anything works. There's so many promoted silver bullets on social media. Like yeah posting this frequency will do x and y yeah that's kind of impossible to sustain for somebody doing it themselves exactly and everyone's different everyone is completely different and everyone is theoretically posting a different type of content they're posting it for a different reason and i think so would you argue that yeah there's nothing that's effectively every post is unique yes so there are broad kind of algorithmic principles yeah but it does come down to who you are, what your history is with the audience. Exactly, what you want to achieve, what the community is like. Maybe the community is really engaged of an evening. Maybe it's not of a morning. So then you've got to post something different. I think there's so much, you can spend so much time catching yourself up with things and tying yourself in knots, kind of what you're saying of these are the best you know, these, this is the best content to post or this is this. Yeah, there are general rules that actually your content, like on Instagram... You can't break the rules and thrive. Yeah, essentially, yeah. You know, like on Instagram, you know, 
reels are far more pushed out than still still assets. Okay, yeah, that's a rule of thumb. So you can take that and apply it to your business or your brand, however you would like to, but you don't have to get into the nitty gritty of it. I don't think anyone's in a position of specifying anything and being really granular with it because like I said, every account's different and every one's journey's different and everyone's audience is different. You know, yes, there are general rules of thumb that actually is really helpful for you to know, particularly if you're a sm small business owner. So hypothetical situation. Yeah. You're sat down with one of your contacts at Instagram, say. Yeah. And you lay out all of the posts that you're planning mm -hmm. for Stephen. Yeah. Could Instagram tell you which one to fly? I don't think they could. Right. I so really don't think they could. This, right. The algorithms are an algorithm. The yeah. People who are saying they know how it works. I don't think people... No, because let's just play devil's advocate. There could be a line of a string of posts. Let's just say there's something really topical that happens next week. There's no way that that person that you're talking to would know that. And actually that piece of content that I've got right in front of me is going to fall into that category. There's no way that they're going to know that because that's not even happened yet. Mm -hmm. So there's elements of the reactivity that actually you will not you will not know until you need to be reactive in that moment. So th that's where you need to lean on it. So I think, like I said, you can have a general awareness and you can understand what's going on with the platform. But ultimately, every piece of content is different. And actually, you will know your audience best and you will know what resonates with them best, better than anybody else, because they're not directly speaking to them. They're not building the business or the brand that you're trying to build. So... I think that's a, a piece of advice that I, I think is, is super useful if you're starting out because it can be really overwhelming. I obviously repost a lot of things. Yeah. I'm not making new stuff all the time. Yeah. Some stuff, I'll, we call it replaying your best hits. Yeah, amazing. So basically look back at what we did years ago, mm -hmm. bring it back out. And I brought a post out. I did a post about two years ago. Yeah. Absolutely blew up. It was incredible. Mm -hmm. And then did the post again, almost identical, mm -hmm. and it didn't blow up. Mm -hmm. And when I look back at like what happened with the post, mm -hmm. it came down to a handful of individuals who engaged first yeah. and who they were, yeah, not necessarily the post. So in some senses, we might have posts that could absolutely fly, mm -hmm. but because of whatever happens in the first 30 minutes mm -hmm. with who sees it, who engages can make it massively different. Exactly. And also if you're engaging with them in the first 30 minutes, because that's, again, something to bear in mind, particularly for LinkedIn. When you post a piece of content, I always try and be mindful of this. I, or I try and do this when, where by possible, but it's engaging within that kind of hotspot of the, you know, of the 30 minutes of the post coming out. That is where you need to be drawing your attention to because that is where that, algorithm is working out actually who am I pushing this out to how many people am I serving this piece of content to what direction is it going in it's understanding actually the responsiveness to that post so as many eyes as you can get on that in that first kind of hotspot moment is so important because then it will tell you so much and like you're saying particularly with LinkedIn you know when you have people of different calibre or, you know, different background or, or, or job experience engaging with a series of content or a specific post within that initial period, that can be so amazing and completely change your post as opposed to, like you were saying, if you're just rinse and repeating something. There are those small factors that actually you do need to be mindful of. And I think on LinkedIn, it's the comment section that's definitely not utilized enough. It's so powerful. Mm -hmm. It's so powerful. Even posting posting a post as you would do normally, and then in the comment section, writing a question, um, maybe asking for what other content they would like to see, maybe developing the point even more. You really use it. Posting the yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like really utilizing that as like the hub of engagement and really getting people talking. A phrase that actually um, I think is always really good, obviously, depending on your goal and what you feel comfortable with, but um, is you might post a sentence or a direct kind of um, adamant, you know, thought about something. And then you might say, um, what are your thoughts? All opinions welcome below. 
I think having all opinions is really, really interesting and really, really a powerful phrase because you wouldn't be, you know, surprised at the amount of people that actually will then give their true, honest opinion about something. Yeah, I suppose if you're making a point and you're really pushing it hard, yeah, reasonable human beings don't want to go on and disagree. Exactly. But also you're creating a space where it's up for conversation and things are actually flowing and you're actually creating rapport with somebody. And you often will find then, you know, LinkedIn or your LinkedIn followers and community will then be start talking with one another, which is such a powerful position to be in because obviously they're strengthening the community and that's actually what you want them to do. But I think really utilizing that comment section yeah exactly like continuing the post in the comment section is so powerful and it really teaches you what people want to see and what people don't want to see and what avenue you should go in with your community because they're giving you it's like a focus group like they're giving you their honest real opinion about something I think it's really important for if you don't know what direction to take your content in or you don't know how to utilize particularly LinkedIn always use that comment section as like a um a, a tool in your bag okay so thinking about linkedin yeah you can obviously upload documents which become carousels mm -hmm. like instagram and you can post videos yeah which do you think is better videos 100 percent. yeah i do um what's the logic behind why you think videos are better than carousels for LinkedIn, I think they're better because when you look at actually the biggest app, well, the apps that are downloaded the most, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat's up there as well, obviously LinkedIn, but primarily out of all of the top apps is video content. It's the 9 by 16 content. It's like the quick scrolling content. That is what people are really, really used to seeing. It's YouTube shorts. It's, you know... uh videos and reels and whatever on reddit it's that kind of thing that actually people are really really used to seeing so i think in terms of a content style and what actually works best is definitely videos we've tried before actually we did a test of um posting documents like you're saying that would then manifest into carousels and actually looking at the likes and the comments from that as opposed to videos and videos always outperform again it might be Whatever you want to get out of LinkedIn, that's up to you to make your best judgment. But theoretically speaking, definitely, definitely, definitely videos. And I think that's just from the pace of when people are scrolling. It's much easier to capture someone's attention in the first three, five seconds, whatever, with a video than it is with a document. It's more personable. It's more engaging to look at. It's more creative. You can be, there's so many different elements that you can play on with a video. Video you get a deeper connection with the person as well. I yeah, you do. do right? really yeah, of course. Um, because, you know, you feel uncomfortable. It you takes know, time. Like, yeah. Know, times I've filmed a video and then never used it. Yeah. Um, but people get a sense, like you can say something in words, you can say something in a document. Mm -hmm. But when you're articulating it yourself, the tone of voice... Yeah. The posture, how you're saying it all comes out. Yeah. And I've struggled because people say carousels, carousels, carousels. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, I want people to know me. I want people to hear yeah. my thoughts and connect the idea with the person. Exactly. And that's so powerful because it's all about, even if you don't want to build a personal brand, you are still building your personal brand just by default. And you need to be with the amount of users and with the amount of accounts that are on social media now, it's like it's extremely saturated. And what you're saying is correct. Like you need to actually know who you're following, know what they're about. That doesn't mean that you need to share all elements of your life, but even, yeah, what their voice sounds like, you know, what how they articulate themselves, like you're saying with body language, everything like that is painting a clearer picture of that person and therefore, yeah, allows for a deeper connection. And I think there's a time and a place for still assets, for sure. It depends what you want to get across. But I think video allows you to unleash something that's so powerful, particularly on LinkedIn. And I don't think people of link on LinkedIn have fully, fully taken adv advantage of that yet. I think it's starting to do that. And I'm, I'm seeing obviously more and more video, particularly with Steve's content. But ultimately that type of content is so precious and so is such an advantage point and such a good touch point for you to help 
you build your brand story and the personality behind it. Because like I said, you're following that account for a reason and it will allow you to create that you know, connection and everything like that far more deeper than if you're just sticking with carousel posts. Mm-hmm. People don't want to make a mistake. Yeah. They don't want to damage their own brand, right? So there is that kind of fear of damaging their sure. brand. How would you advise them to straddle the kind of, you have to mm-hmm. you have to stand for something. You have to yeah. have opinions, but not be um, the provocateur. Yeah, it's an interesting one because um, when you said that, it just made me think of Steve always gives us this example about um, Brewdog and he always says how their job is literally just pissing everybody off in that industry. Like that is literally what they're known for and that's what gets people talking and their social campaigns are really kind of well, um, yeah, well recognised for. But I think, again, it's within reason. I think the worst thing that you can do, and Steve is such a huge believer in this and is definitely spot on from what I have seen and what I have learned is that yeah standing for nothing is just literally worse than having like an outlandish opinion like it's you can't have a presence online and be vanilla about it and stand for nothing it's quite literally just it's just wasting your time but I think it's a good question for those brands that want to make more of their mark in the industry it's like well how do you do that I think there are elements that you can play around with but I think ultimately another example that comes to mind is Ryanair so when you look at their social media particularly Twitter or X now should I say um they are so good at obviously I mean whenever I read their account I can literally picture someone sat behind on the computer like just typing away like you can see their face as they're doing it they're just making themselves laugh and just being like okay post and it's just humorous and it's amusing and it's quite incredible how they've taken from where it was sorry from where it was to where it is now but I think it's about building that personality. You don't have to give outlandish opinions if a business, let's just say it's a startup business and they want to make their mark in uh, the wellness sector, but they don't want to be giving really strong opinions. That's fine. But then I think what other elements and what other touch points have you got to actually really show your the brand's personality to your audience. I think there's other ways of doing it. You just might have to get creative in in the ways that you're doing it. You see some people basically using the equivalence of rubbernecking, mm-hmm. creating these shock horror posts, whether that be really emotional or attacking other people mm-hmm. to kind of get attention. What's your view on that kind of, um, maybe not trolling, but attention yes. baiting? I don't think it's worth it at all. I think it leaves a really sour taste for your existing audience and also alienates any potential new following and your new community by posting something like that. I think if by any stretch of the imagination it actually falls into what you were trying to achieve and it's on brand on brand for you, like, you know, Brewdog as an example that Steve always shouts about. If it's very on brand on brand for you and this is what you're kind of standing by and there's a purpose behind it and it's actually thought out, okay, do what you need to do. But I think do not do anything like that just for the sake of posting at all. I think it really, it waters down your brand and actually it does not look good from a brand identity, a brand image point of view. And I think for that average kind of business that's starting out, in no way, shape, or form would they should they ever feel like they need to jump on doing anything like that at all. I really don't think it's worth it's like it. It's a great spectacle, isn't it? Yeah. And and it's also like what okay, yeah. Like we're saying, human nature, you know, people love to look at something, people love like juicy gossip that's going on. Okay, great. But then what happens when that dies down? Because it does die down, and then there'll be something else. And then you need something bigger. Yeah. Bigger. And you're tying yourself in knots, and it's not a positive way to run a social media channel which doesn't look good for you at all and like I said taking Brewdog out of that example because that's you know they kind of throw around different opinions and things like that but that is very on brand for them but for the average person like I said unless it's extremely extremely on brand with you and there's strategy and there's thought actually that's gone on behind it posting things that's really inflammatory and actually causes a heated topic for absolutely no reason other than just to get views Attention. yeah is not a good silly, look yeah. yeah and I just think you should not play with fire like it's not something that 
to be you know advised at all on tiktok you might want to push the boundaries a little bit more because obviously that kind of more controversial stuff of course gets views but equally there's a time and a place for everything and i think you've got to be you've got to be careful on that one it's it's a really really thin line and i think if you do that wrong which a lot of people do and it's very hard to kind of actually have a strong opinion and and do it correctly then it's just not worth doing if we're talking about really extreme it's hard now to to, particularly if it's individuals doing it to individuals it's really difficult to work out what is banter and what is bullying yeah it's just not i just think it's just really bad a really really bad look and we've seen so many times before with businesses or with creators that are you know old content has been resurfaced and that's actually just bitten them in the current day and it's just really it's just not worth doing anything like that at all I think you know you have a social media account as an individual as a business for a reason it's whatever your objective is if it's to post funny videos and to have a personal page that's completely fine that's your objective that's up to you but I think the minute where you are trying to build something bigger and you are asking of people to buy your products to invest in your brand to actually care about what you're doing you cannot be posting things like that because it's crossing a boundary that is not professional and I think is not appropriate for what you want out of it like I said Brewdog is a completely different example but for the average person and for the average business that's starting out it's just not it's playing with fire yeah okay final question yeah because we've kind of sucked your brains out today here but Somebody's starting, mm-hmm. they've got loads of different social media channels, mm-hmm. so many hours, mm-hmm. limited time. Mm-hmm. Do they go it all in on one? Mm-hmm. Do they pick all of them? Yeah. And what's your advice to somebody going, I can't do all of this and do it well? What's what's the hack they need to do or what's the thing they need to do? All in on one. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Because find out first, okay, understand first let's just say if it's, an, if it's a new business, if it's a small business, let's just say um, a coffee shop. You salon on LinkedIn. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Let's just use the example of a beauty salon in a, in a small town in England somewhere. Okay, right. Figure out how does the brand want to be perceived online? What's the brand identity? The key things that you need to know. Okay, work out obviously your customer base. Where is your customer base? Where is it? Okay, I would have thought it would either be on Instagram or potentially TikTok, but I would say more on Instagram without obviously having the specifics, just generalizing. Okay, right. Then you need to focus your attention onto Instagram. There is no point wasting your time and your energy, your resources, paying somebody else to do it, to actually diversify and be on five, six different social media channels when you are not getting everything that you possibly could out of the one that you need to be on it's just wasting your time and I think often they're not there's such a pressure to be on all of the different social media channels because you don't want to get left behind and because there's new things coming out but that kind of goes back to the point at the start of the conversation where figure out what your objective is how you want your brand to come across online how you want your personal brand or your company or whatever and find the right platform for that. For others, it might be LinkedIn. It might be Snap. It might be Twitter X. It might be whatever. But focus on the one. Focus or even on the two. But do not do all of them because you'll just waste your time. And it will be so confusing trying to understand where your leads are coming from and to build a community. I would rather have a really solid community on one platform and be really happy with its growth and know that the community is there and actually it's the right path to where I want the business and the grant and the brand, sorry, to grow rather than being on all of the others and wasting your time. So always, always one or two at best. Brilliant. So Holly, thank you for coming down to Plymouth all the way to the sticks. No, yeah. thank you so much for having um, me. The one thing I can assure you is it's a little bit warmer. It's like minus two. Here. Yeah. So, uh, thank you so much for coming. We're going to be doing some events with you. So, Amazing. Uh, we'll be telling everybody about that and getting them all to come and pick your brains in person. Perfect. Thank you so, so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Awesome. Thank you.